Okay, so uh, we just talked about alpha, beta, and gamma decay. I'll put in one final word before we move on to what half-life is. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, the only other thing, the only other kind of decay that uh, that's important for the course. So we've got alpha, uh, which releases uh, a helium. We've got beta. That releases an electron. And we've got gamma. That releases uh, electromagnetic radiation. So gamma waves, shall we say. The only other thing, uh, well, one something I should quickly mention is that when some of the heavier elements decay, they actually send off neutrons at speed. So uranium, for instance, and in, in nuclear reactors, they they send off neutrons um, as a as a decay product. And uh, if we smash these neutrons into other substances, to other atoms, uh, we can basically add those neutrons to the atomic core, send a neutron at speed into an atomic core, and basically add it on. That adds to the atomic weight of the uh, of the atom and creates a new isotope. We're going to get to the kind of production of new new elements uh, using nuclear means in a bit. But uh, before we get there, there's a couple more things to discuss. First one is half-life. Now, unstable atoms don't decay instantaneously. They do so at a random juncture. So different isotopes, uh, particular weights, particular elements, are more or less likely to randomly decay in a given period of time. So some are highly unstable and will decay very quickly, and some of them are not as unstable and they'll decay relatively slowly. Uh, now, as time goes on, and more, say you have a, a whole bunch of a, of a radioactive isotope. Now, as time goes on, uh, let's say these dots represent, as time goes on, more, these, is, these are each atom that's changing over, that's decaying, changing to a new product, so it's not the old one. Just kind of like with chemical equilibrium, in some ways, as time goes on, you've got less and less of the original thing, and you can imagine that after a certain amount of time, you've got a lot less of the thing. So what that means is that the, the amount of this material is dropping over time, like that, at, at a constant rate, because this, this um, well, actually, no, it's not dropping at a constant rate, but, uh, but the, um, each individual uh, atom is randomly going over at a constant rate. Now, because there's less and less of the material as time goes on, that means there's less and less left over to randomly switch over. So as more of them decay, there are fewer left over to randomly decay, and that means that the rate of decrease of the substance is itself decreasing. So if your rate of decrease is itself decreasing, that means that uh, the rate of decay in terms of the amount of time it takes, uh, that's the best way of putting it, uh, basically you're going to get a graph that it drops very quickly to begin with, as there's lots of the material that's decaying, but now there's less and less of the material, and it's going to taper off. And for each period of time, Basically, for a given period of time, uh, rather, for, for each individual isotope that is decaying, there is a given period of time for which half of it will have gone. So we see here, uh, x here will be the half-life. Uh, it's gone from this amount down to this amount. It's halved. And then in the next period of x time, it's just going to halve again. It's not going to disappear. So, so a half-life the period it takes a half of the substance to decay. Uh, so after 2x it's down to 1 quarter and after 3x it's down to 1 8 etc. 
So half-life is the period it takes for half of the substance to decay. And there's no other meaningful way of kind of describing this curve uh, simply, except to say half, because there's no amount of time in which all of it decays, because its rate is going, uh, the rate of all uh, isotopes, the rate of full decay is, is close to infinite, because uh, we going to get down to less and less of these molecules. But we do know what the rate it takes, or how long it will take for half of it to decay. That's the half-life. Okay, final thing uh, with, uh, with decay is this deflection question which comes up. Basically the idea is, well, what will happen if we put a negatively charged electric field up here and positively charged electric field down here and then we have some kind of source of all three kinds of the radiation that we talked about so we got, um, we got alpha radiation I think uh, got this symbol like got beta which is this symbol and got gamma I don't know what it signals but um, just say A, B and G uh, coming out and it's like well what's going to happen to each kind of radiation and the answer is pretty simple if you think about it alpha is positive, beta is negative and gamma is a wave it's not a particle uh, of any charge so what happens is the beta radiation which is negative is repelled from the negative field and attracted to the positive field so it curves towards the positive field uh, the alpha radiation is attracted to the negative, ejected from the positive, so it curves towards the negative, and the gamma just goes straight ahead. So the idea is that you've got deflection based on the charge of the kind of radiation, and the neutral one goes straight. Pretty straightforward, but it does come up a bit in HSC, so I thought I'd mention it. All right, we're going to go straight on to new elements and transuranic elements. So we've talked already about decay and how uh, basically one atom can decay into, into all kinds of products or, um, or release things. But now we're going to talk about kind of the opposite approach, the opposite process. Uh, under the right conditions, we can actually create new isotopes by adding neutrons to atoms or by smashing atoms together. So you can take one atom, smash it into another atom, um, and then get a whole new product, um, which is, you know, let's say that's even bigger. And, you know, that's going to have a new atomic number, it's going to have a new atomic weight, it's going to be a whole new isotope we didn't have before. Uh, one that's handy to know is the first uh, first lab-made element. So the first time that mankind created an element that only exists in the laboratory. That element is called technetium. So that's TC. Uh, it does not exist in nature. Uh, and it's got atomic number of 43, if I remember correctly. And the way it was created was a man named Seaborg. It actually, it, it was kind of created by accident in the lab earlier than this, but Seaborg uh, got his hands on those results and he was the first one who figured out how to make it on purpose. Uh, what he did was he smashed a deuterium, and we've already talked about deuterium, so it's hydrogen with an atomic weight of two. Number one, like all hydrogen. He smashed that into a molybdenum uh, molecule. That's a molybdenum 95, particular isotope of molybdenum. If I recall, this has a atomic number, pretty sure actually, it's got a atomic number of 42. Now, he smashed it together, and the maths on this is really straightforward. We just add these numbers together. So this weighs 2, this weighs 95, so that's 97. Uh, and then this is 40, 
32, this is 1, so it's 43. You could look up on your uh, on your periodic table what that is. Of course, I've already discussed that it is uh, technetium, Tc, uh, Tc43, Tc for atomic number 43, Tc97 in this case. So he smashed a deuterium into a molybdenum 95 and created uh, Tc technetium 97 uh, molecule or atom rubber. And that's the first time that man created uh, an element in the lab. Now, the way they did that was using a, a cyclotron. Uh, you can't just um, you can't just introduce a deuterium molecule to a molybdenum. You can't you can't just mix them together uh, and hope that this is going to happen. Uh, we're going to create a new one. You actually have to get this deuterium uh, and in a cyclotron, you zoom it around and around in a circle, and its motion gets faster and faster. And then, when you decide it's fast enough, you you let it zoom out into a plate of molybdenum, and hopefully, it smashes in and creates a new element. And you do it many, many times in order to get enough of this to be measured. And uh, so that's what he did. He figured out how to do all this and create the first new element. And the basic process uh, for us creating new elements hasn't changed since. Uh, just going to wipe our blackboard. blackboard. Yes, yeah, so the basic process of creating new elements has not changed since. Uh, we accelerate them into each other. And we've gotten better and better accelerating heavier and heavier elements into each other. Uh, yeah. So that's one way. So one way we can one way we can create uh, heavier elements is to smash one element uh, plus another element, smash them together, smash one to the other, create a bigger element. The other way we can do it. Uh, or the other way we create new isotopes is we simply take an element and we add from a neutron source like uranium that we were talking about earlier. We just add neutrons, and what that does is it creates the same element. It doesn't change the element, but it does change its atomic weight. So this goes up by one, whatever this was. This has x, x plus one, um, but if it's an element Y, it's still element Y with atomic number Y. Um, we've just added neutrons and created a new isotope. Now that might give it new nuclear properties, like now it's unstable and it'll decay, and that's what we want. Uh, we can do this multiple times. So we can create the X plus 1, and then we can throw more neutrons onto it, and it goes up and up and up uh, until it decays or, or something else changes. So that's that's the second way. So we can add neutrons. First way is that we smash atoms together using an accelerator. That's how we create things. All right, a bit more on technetium. There's a particular isotope of technetium, not the one that Seaborg created that time. Uh, called technetium ninety nine. So in the next video we're going to talk uh, a bit about the medical uses of technetium ninety nine and also how we produce it.